Health Summary Good health is necessary for all citizens to flourish. In the last year, the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded the UK public of the vital role of the health service, but it has also shone a light on disparities in the health and well-being of people in the UK. In examining this theme, the Commission has carefully considered the available evidence and engaged widely with relevant experts and frontline workers. An analysis of available evidence into health disparities has shown again just how inappropriate it is to consider these issues under the term BAME, as there are such deep differences in the prevalence and outcome of health conditions both between and within ethnic groups in the UK. The Commission rejects the common view that ethnic minorities have universally worse health outcomes compared with white people. The picture is much more variable. From the evidence reviewed, the following conclusions have been drawn. For many key health outcomes, including life expectancy, overall mortality, and many of the leading causes of mortality in the UK, ethnic minority groups have better outcomes than the white population. This evidence clearly suggests that ethnicity is not the major driver of health inequalities in the UK, but deprivation, geography, and differential exposure to key risk factors. Given that most ethnic minorities have higher levels of deprivation compared with the white majority population, these health outcomes clearly suggest that deprivation is not destiny. More needs to be done to investigate why some ethnic minority groups are doing better than others, exploring whether it's due to differences in important risk factors, family structures, better social networks, or health behaviours such as drinking alcohol and smoking. For some health conditions, there is variation within the broader ethnic group. For example, the risk of many cancers had significant differences for Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi ethnic groups. For COVID-19 and many other health conditions, there is a complex interplay of socio-economic, behavioural, cultural and, in some cases, genetic risk factors, which lead to disparities. The Commission heard evidence which, in contrast to the narrative of other reports, suggests there is no overwhelming evidence of racism in the treatment and diagnosis of mental health conditions. In this area in particular, far more research is needed to understand the interplay of different causes and to understand the impact of issues such as mistrust of the health services amongst some groups. The Commission would like to see more in-depth research on the root causes of health disparities in physical and mental health, as well as a more systematic approach to how campaigns and communications are used in an ethnically diverse country. Understanding Disparities in Health The quality of data of health disparities is mixed, and there are challenges in obtaining consistent ethnicity data across different health conditions. But the Commission was able to consider the evidence that does exist, looking at the 25 leading causes of premature mortality in the UK as well as the key risk factors for these conditions, including obesity, smoking and alcohol use. The findings show significant variations between different ethnic minority groups, including between South Asian groups and between Black African and Black Caribbean people. In considering disparities in health, the analysis considered both ethnicity and deprivation because there are strong associations between them. A summary of the key findings is outlined below, and the full analysis supplementary paper with accompanying charts is available in the supporting documents published alongside this report. Life Expectancy and Health Life Expectancy Life expectancy reflects the impact of the key determinants of health, socioeconomic, education, income, housing, employment, over the whole life course, and so is the best measure of overall health, Deprivation is often considered to be the main factor associated with lower life expectancy. However, some ethnic minorities have longer life expectancies, despite being poorer than white people overall. Data for Scotland has shown that life expectancy is generally higher in the larger ethnic minority populations than the majority white Scottish group, particularly for people from Indian, Pakistani and Chinese ethnic groups. This is despite higher levels of deprivation. A review of Ethnicity and Poverty by Joseph Rowntree Foundation 
found that all ethnic minority groups in Scotland were disadvantaged on one or more poverty indicators, with Pakistani and Bangladeshi and black households experiencing higher rates of poverty than others. Life expectancy data for England, where 97% of the ethnic minorities in the UK lives, is not yet published. But overall age-standardised mortality rates, which are closely correlated with life expectancy, in 2019 were 26% lower in black and South Asian people than for white people, again despite higher levels of deprivation. The figures for white people overall also hide very significant intra-white differences for those who live in the 10% most deprived areas of England, predominantly in the north and coastal towns, living on average 10 years less compared with the 10% least deprived, the gap between Blackpool and Westminster. There is limited data on healthy life expectancy, the average number of years that an individual is expected to live in a state of self-assessed good or very good health by ethnicity. One paper from Scotland, using linked 2011 census data, showed that despite having longer life expectancy than white people, women in the Pakistani and Indian ethnic groups had shorter healthy life expectancy. Of the 25 leading causes of premature mortality, as measured by years of life lost, people from South Asian, Black and Chinese ethnic groups have better outcomes than white people in more than half of these. Figure 17. Causes of premature mortality measured by years of life lost, compared with the population average by ethnicity and cause of death. England, 2016. Audio description of chart. The chart cross-references causes of mortality in England with ethnic minorities. Each intersection on the chart rates the relative risk to the ethnic group as compared with the white majority. The ratings are green, amber or red. The following intersections are rated red. Ischematic heart disease. South Asian, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi. Stroke. South Asian, Pakistani. Bangladeshi, Black, Black African, Black Caribbean. Dementia slash Alzheimer's disease, Black. Neonatal preterm birth, South Asian, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Black, Black African, Black Caribbean. Congenital defects, South Asian, Pakistani, Black. Other cardiovascular disease, Pakistani. Road injuries. Black. Cirrhosis. Alcohol. Indian. Prostate cancer. Black. Black African. Black Caribbean. Stomach cancer. Black. Black Caribbean. Chinese. Lymphoma. Black African. Cirrhosis hepatitis C. South Asian. Indian. Pakistani. Bangladeshi. Black. Black African. Black Caribbean. Chinese. Cancer. Cancer is the leading cause of death in the UK overall, accounting for 28% of all deaths. For all cancers, and 9 out of 11 leading causes of cancer death, it is the white population that have the highest incidence, and in some cases poorer survival. The breakdown of incidence and survival rates from different cancers is by itself enough evidence of why ethnic minority groups should be disaggregated in health data and research if health providers want to effectively target healthcare interventions. Compared with white ethnic groups, South Asian people have a much lower incidence of every one of the 11 causes of cancer deaths. The black population generally has a slightly lower incidence for all cancers and most of the leading cancers, but significantly increased risk of stomach and prostate cancer. People from Chinese ethnic group also generally have a slightly lower incidence for all of the leading cancers except stomach cancer. Among South Asian people, there is a significant difference in risk for many cancers between the Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi ethnic groups, highlighting the importance of analysing them separately. For Black African and Black Caribbean people, the difference in risk was also apparent for some cancers. This is to be expected for the majority of cancers, given the differences between diets, habits and socio-cultural practices in the three main South Asian groups 
and between black African and black Caribbean people. For certain cancers, however, the incidence was unusually high or low in all three main South Asian groups, or both black groups, which is suggestive of a genetic predisposition, for example, prostate melanoma, pituitary in black people, gallbladder and thyroid in South Asian people, or protection, malignant melanoma in black and South Asian people. The lower incidence of many cancers in South Asian people, even when the majority have spent most of their lives in the UK or were born here, is striking. This contrasts with, for example, the experience of Japanese migrants to the USA, who were found to have similar rates and number of cancers, for example, colorectal, to white Americans within one generation. This could be due to dietary factors, with most South Asian people still maintaining a fairly typical South Asian diet. Or there may be genetic differences which provide some protection against certain cancers. There may be potential for cancer prevention here if, for example, aspects of the diet are found to be protective. In general, cancer incidence in South Asian people tends to be closer to that of white people amongst those aged under 50, 50% 50 of whom were born in the UK, and with many more migrating as children, than among those who are older than 50 years, virtually all born outside of the UK. This is consistent with environmental exposures, particularly at young ages being important in the study of the causes of these cancers, and it is unlikely that ethnicity itself, or genetic factors, are responsible for most of the observed differences in incidence with ethnicity instead acting as a proxy for environmental or lifestyle factors, including smoking, alcohol and diet. The pattern in black people was more mixed, which may reflect the different patterns of migration for black African and black Caribbean people, and so is harder to interpret. In general, as would be expected for most cancers, where the environment is the most important risk factor, the incidence of cancer in the immigrant population is related to the gradual adoption of Western habits and lifestyles. However, there were some notable exceptions, with the somewhat unusual finding that the incidence in the ethnic group was higher than both country or region of origin than in the white ethnic groups in the UK. For example, cancers of the thyroid, prostate, stomach, gallbladder, myeloma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma in black people, and of the thyroid, liver, gallbladder, and Hodgkin lymphoma in South Asian people. This is likely to be due to underdiagnosis or underreporting in many of the countries of origin, due to the limited access to healthcare facilities and lack of comprehensive cancer registration. Also, there may be genetic predisposition to developing these conditions in these ethnic groups, which means they could still likely maintain high incidence after migration. For other cancers, mainly in South Asian people, incidence in the ethnic group was lower than both country or region of origin and white people, for example stomach, cervix, malignant melanoma, reflecting a reduction in exposure to the harmful risk factor after migration, for example reduced exposure to H. pylori, HPV, ultraviolet B radiation. For the cancers where data is available, Survival is generally better or the same for lung, prostate and colorectal in ethnic minority, not including white minority, groups, with mixed evidence for breast cancer. This may reflect decreased uptake of screening for breast cancer, where South Asian people and black people generally have lower uptake of screening, which is also the case for colorectal and cervical cancer. Cardiometabolic diseases, CVD, stroke, and diabetes. Cardiovascular diseases causes 27% of all deaths in the UK in 2019. There is striking variation in CVD risk between South Asian and black ethnic groups. CVD prevalence is higher in South Asian people. For CVD incidence, the highest risk is in women from the Pakistani ethnic group and men from the Bangladeshi ethnic group. In contrast, CVD prevalence and incidence are lower amongst black African and black Caribbean people. Men and women from the Chinese ethnic group also have lower CVD incidence than the white group. South Asian people had more ischemic heart disease, IHD, the commonest type of CVD. 
they also had hypertension and diabetes. And the black group had more hypertension and diabetes, but lower IHD than the white group. Stroke is more common in black people, who are at 1.5 to 2.5 times greater risk of having a stroke than white people. South Asian people also have a risk of stroke about 1.5 times greater than white people, particularly in Pakistani and Bangladeshi ethnic groups. In contrast, people from the Chinese ethnic group have a lower risk of stroke than white populations. Data from the Stroke Register in London shows that while stroke incidence has decreased by 40% for white people in the past years, it has not decreased for black people. There are a few studies that have investigated ethnic and social disparities for CVD procedures. Amid the limited evidence, there was none for systematic differences by ethnicity. The Whitehall study on the relationship between health and social status found no evidence that a low social status or South Asian ethnicity was associated with lower use of cardiac procedures or drugs, independently of clinical need, and differences in medical care were unlikely to contribute to social or ethnic differences in coronary heart disease in this cohort. Type 2 Diabetes Compared with the majority white European-UK population, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is higher for ethnic minority groups. When diagnosed biochemically, type 2 diabetes prevalence is up to 3 to 6 fold higher in South Asian and black ethnic groups compared with white people. Self-reported diabetes prevalence is 3 to 5 fold higher amongst Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian and black Caribbean ethnic groups compared with the general population. The higher diabetes risk amongst South Asian, Black African and Black Caribbean immigrants is shared by people in their countries of origin. For ethnic minority groups, diabetes develops at a younger age and at a lower body mass index than for the white population. The mean average age of onset of type 2 diabetes is approximately 5 to 10 years younger in migrant South Asian and white European adults. This may be due to the younger age profile of these groups, the South Asian median age is 10 years less than the white population. Age-specific incidence and prevalence rates would need to be calculated to see if there is a genuine difference by age. There are also differences in complications of diabetes by ethnic group. The reasons for the high risk of type 2 diabetes, IHD and stroke in South Asian people, and of higher diabetes and stroke risk but not IHD in black groups, are not completely clear, but may be explained in part by differences in risk factors. Age, sex, genetics and ethnicity are fixed factors, but potentially modifiable factors are critical to understand and manage. Socioeconomic factors are also relevant. Outcomes, risk factors and causes of the causes. Figure 18 shows the relationships between risk factors and outcomes for the main five causes of death and disability in the UK across one's life course. It shows how proximal and intermediate risk factors, which are behavioural and in theory modifiable by individuals, are in turn affected by distral risk factors or the causes of the causes. Some of these are fixed, for example genetics, whereas others can be changed, for example socio-economic factors but often require the government or societal action to facilitate that change. Although interventions can be implemented at all distances of risk factors, the earlier they are applied in the life course, the greater the impact on prevention of the outcome. Figure 18. The relationship between the causes and outcomes of the five main causes of death and disability. Audio description of diagram. Four rectangles are displayed side by side. Each contains some writing. Each pair of rectangles has an arrow joining and pointing in both directions, indicating movement between the two rectangles. The leftmost rectangle reads, Digital risk factors, causes of the causes. Socioeconomic factors, genetics, epigenetics, exposures in the womb, early life. The second rectangle says, Intermediate risk factors, modifiable, behavioural. Tobacco, alcohol, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, air pollution. 
The third rectangle says, Proximal risk factors, also outcomes. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, high glucose, obesity. The fourth and final rectangle says, Outcomes, five main causes of death and disability. Heart disease, cancer, chronic lung diseases, diabetes, mental health disorders. End of audio description. Obesity. Black adults had consistently higher rates of obesity than white adults. Adults and children from the Chinese ethnic group had consistently lower risk of obesity than white people. There were no consistent patterns in South Asian adults or children relative to white people. There are significant limitations in the data on this topic. Few studies explore and statistically adjust for potential predictors of obesity amongst ethnic minority groups particularly the known risk factors for obesity, such as socioeconomic status, maternal BMI, physical activity and diet. This makes it difficult to know why any ethnic differences arise. Use of aggregated ethnicity categories such as South Asian can mask important differences between smaller groups such as the Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi ethnic groups. Figure 19 Percentage of children who were obese by ethnicity and school year. Reception year and year six. England, April 2019 to March 2020. Audio description of chart. The bar chart displays two percentages, one for reception and one for year six, indicating the amount of obese children in each ethnic group. White, reception, 9.6%. White, year six, 19.4%. Mixed, reception, 10.3%. Mixed, year 6, 23.4%. Asian, reception, 9.6%. Asian, year 6, 25.3%. Black, reception, 15%. Black, year 6, 29.7%. Chinese, reception, 4.5%. Chinese, year 6, 19.6%. Other, reception, 10.7%. Other, year 6, 25.4%. End of audio description. Interventions to reduce obesity across the population may still need to be sensitive to ethnic, socioeconomic and cultural factors that may make some interventions less likely to be engaged with by some population subgroups. Behavioural risk factors Diet, physical activity, tobacco use and alcohol use are the key risk factors for cardiometabolic diseases and cancer. In 2019, 13.9% of adults in England were current smokers. Prevalence of smoking was highest in individuals with mixed ethnicity, 19.5%, and lowest in people from the Chinese ethnic group, 6.7%. Compared with the benchmark of 13.9% in the population as a whole, white and mixed ethnicity adults have higher smoking rates. Asian, black and Chinese adults have lower smoking rates. Figure 20. Percentage of adults who smoked cigarettes, England, 2019. Audio description of chart. This bar chart indicates approximate percentages of each ethnic group that smoke as adults. Asian, 7%. Black, 9%. Chinese, 6%. Mixed, 19%. White, 15%. Other, 16%. End of audio description. Ethnic differences in smoking in children are different from those in adults. Boys and girls of black and Asian ethnicity were most likely to have never smoked, whereas boys and girls in the white and mixed ethnic groups are most likely to be regular smokers. This may indicate evolving changes in ethnic differences in smoking that will be reflected in adults in due course. South Asian people are more likely to use non-cigarette forms of tobacco, such as smokeless tobacco and shisha, and this may mean that overall exposure to tobacco is underestimated in some ethnic groups in national surveys that focus exclusively on cigarette smoking. Young South Asian people, 
are least likely to have ever drunk alcohol, and those of white ethnicity most likely to have drunk alcohol. The differences between groups is more than five times, 10% and 52%. The prevalence of recent alcohol consumption is also highest in white young people and lowest in Asian young people. In this case, the ratio is more than tenfold, 13% and 1%. Table 8. Percentage of boys and girls in years 7 to 11 who have ever drunk alcohol by ethnicity, 2018. White boys, 51%. White girls, 52%. Mixed boys, 36%. Mixed girls, 43%. Asian boys, 10%. Asian girls, 10%. Black boys, 21%. Black girls, 24%. Other boys, 30%. Other girls, 17%. White British men and women are most likely to be drinking at hazardous, harmful or dependent levels, and Asian men and women least likely. White British men are more than six times as likely to be drinking at hazardous, harmful and dependent levels than Asian men, 22.6% and 3.7% and white British women are more than five times as likely to be drinking at this level than Asian women, 14.8% and 2.6%. The Active Live survey collects self-reported physical activity and has shown that white adults are most likely to be active and people of Asian ethnicity the least likely to be active. Men are consistently as or more likely to be active than women in all ethnic groups. However, Gender differences are more pronounced in some groups. For example, in black people, 64.6% for men and 51.3% for women. Figure 21. Percentage of people aged 16 and over who were physically active by ethnicity. England, 2018 to 2019. Audio description of chart. The bar chart shows approximate percentages of people active by ethnicity. Asian, excluding Chinese, 50%. Black, 55%. Chinese, 60%. Mixed, 70%. White British, 65%. White other, 68%. Other, 55%. End of audio description. Possible reasons for the differences described in figure 21 have been explored. Two reviews focused on South Asian people found that this population group tend to understand the link between physical activity and chronic disease, but underestimate recommended levels of activity. They perceive higher body weights to be healthier than people of white ethnicity, fear racial harassment when exercising, and lack culturally appropriate opportunities for group-based activities such as mixed gender classes or classes delivered in English. Socioeconomic disparities. The analysis of health disparities considered the interplay of socioeconomic factors and ethnicity. The commissioners considered the Marmot Review as part of their investigations into this area, as this report is a seminal examination of the so called social gradient in health, which links levels of health to social class and status, originally in a Whitehall study of civil servants. The Marmot Review did find variations by ethnic minorities. However, it did not answer why the social determinants of health are equally distributed between different racial and ethnic groups. This question was beyond the remit of the review, but was also affected by the lack of consistent data collection on ethnicity in health. There is a well-established link between socioeconomic disparities and risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and many cancers and life expectancy. Disentangling the effects of socioeconomic status and ethnic background is complex. Within each ethnic group there is a social and deprivation gradient, but this may not explain the greater risk seen for some diseases in some ethnic groups. For example, diabetes in South Asian people. For example, in the Whitehall study, there was a strong social gradient with 67% of black Caribbean people 50% of South Asian people, 
and 19% of white European people in the lower end of the grade structure, clerical and support staff. After adjustment for socioeconomic factors, there remained, however, two to four times greater risk of type 2 diabetes and hypertension in both black Caribbean and South Asian ethnic groups compared with the white ethnic groups. Those from black ethnic groups had a more favourable lipid profile, which may explain their lower risk of ischematic heart disease, showing that differences in risk factors cannot be explained by socioeconomic status alone. Lower socioeconomic status leads some of the risk factors observed for overall mortality, including obesity, diabetes and hypertension. People from South Asian groups have a greater prevalence of elevated blood pressure, blood sugar levels, obesity and abnormal HDL cholesterol. Together with insulin resistance, these factors can increase the risks of diabetes, coronary heart disease and stroke. People from black ethnic groups have a lower risk for ischemic heart disease but an increased risk for diabetes and stroke. However, as has already been shown in this report, some ethnic minority groups have higher life expectancies and lower risks of many cancers than the white majority population, despite higher levels of deprivation. These factors are complex, but this is in no way an overall negative picture for ethnic minority groups, and the Commission believes that more should be done to learn from these ethnic minorities that have better health outcomes, despite being more deprived to improve health for all ethnic groups, including the white ethnic group. Role of Genetics and Epigenetics in Explaining Differences Between Ethnic Groups Ethnicity consists of a combination of genetic, cultural and geographical factors, and individual self-reported ethnicity is not necessarily consistent with their genetic ancestry. Furthermore, governmental census categories may be combinations of races, ethnicities, national groupings and aggregations of smaller ethnic groups. For example, the West African contribution to individual African-American ancestry averages about 80%, but ranges from approximately 20 to 100%. Approximately 85% of genetic variation between human beings exist within members of the same ethnic group, but only 10% to 15% being explained by differences between ethnic groups, that is, there is usually more genetic variation between members of the same group than between groups, especially for those of African origin. There are some rare diseases which are markedly more common in certain ethnic groups. These are often related to selective advantages of such mutations or historical genetic bottlenecks within populations. When populations reduce in size and their genetic variation decreases, for example, the presence of sickle cell disease confers protection against malaria, making it more common in African populations where malaria is endemic. Non-disease-related genetic variants have also been identified across ethnic groups. For example, East Asian populations are more likely to be alcohol intolerant than European populations, due to an inactive variant of an alcohol processing gene. And European populations are more likely to be able to drink milk into adulthood due to the presence of a variant of the enzyme lactase. The contribution of genetics to common chronic diseases, such as cancer, diabetes and obesity, is modest. Although there are clear ethnic differences in risk for many of these disorders, genetic variation does not in general explain much of those differences. There are, however, some exceptions – for example, the higher incidence of prostate cancer in black populations. Data on genetic variations in common diseases across ethnic groups are limited. This may reflect a bias within current research, as genetic studies investigating the role of disease tend to predominantly use European or European origin cohorts. New drugs, vaccines and therapies undergo vigorous clinical trials to determine their efficacy and safety before being approved for use. Different subgroups of patients may respond differently to different therapies, depending on their age, gender and ethnicity. With advances in medical research, therapies are increasingly targeted, making it crucial for clinical trials to recruit a diverse range of participants. Diversity of participants in clinical trials investigating standards of care 
is necessary to minimise disparities in outcomes and ensure equity in healthcare. Historically, ethnic minorities have been underrepresented in clinical trials, and this disparity has continued. The Commission heard evidence from academics leading a number of large cohort studies and research programmes that there remains a significant challenge in recruiting enough ethnic minority participants into these trials and studies. The Commission's view is that much more needs to be done in this area, both in terms of research into the barriers and causes of these low numbers of ethnic minority trial participants, and in campaigns and communications to improve these numbers. Case Study Adolescent Cohort Study UK Research and Innovation is developing plans for an Adolescent Health Study, AHS, a major new place-based longitudinal cohort and data platform that will follow more than 100,000 children at different ages through their adolescent years. Participants will be recruited primarily from schools across the UK, and the study will oversample ethnic minorities and underrepresented groups in order to be able to study the origins of health disparities in this formative period of life. Information from the study will support analyses of the rapid developmental changes that happen during adolescence and are affected by puberty in the context of the rapid and unique socio-economic transitions that society is currently undergoing. This means understanding the factors behind resilience and vulnerability to a wide range of conditions, the roots of which often lie in adolescence. There is a gap in engagement, and hence data in this age group, which the AHS will overcome by forming partnerships with young people, their parents, local communities and schools, for example by involving AHS in the curriculum. Adolescents will advise on the best means of data capture, which will be as unobtrusive as possible, often in real time, and include measures such as mental well-being, hormones, inflammation, location, social mobility, retail habits and diet. There has never been such a large study over this period of life anywhere in the world. The AHS will enable researchers to understand adolescent health and its wider impacts in a modern societal context. It is expected to boost research on this formative period and to transform knowledge and policy to improve public health, taking a holistic approach that places health disparities at centre stage. Maternal mortality In 2018, the stillbirth rate in England reached its lowest level on record, at four stillbirths per 1,000 births, a decrease from 5.1 stillbirths in 2010. In 2015 to 2017, 209 women died during or up to the six weeks after pregnancy from causes associated with their pregnancy. This was out of 2,280,451 women giving birth in the UK during this period. 9.2 women per 100,000 died during pregnancy or up to six weeks after childbirth or the end of their pregnancy. Maternal deaths are fortunately rare in the UK. Although analysis of maternal deaths, stillbirths and neonatal deaths undertaken by mothers and babies, reducing risk through audits and confidential inquiries across the UK, MBRRACE-UK, shows that poor outcomes are higher for mothers and babies from black and Asian ethnic groups, particularly those born in Asia or Africa, and for women living in the most deprived areas of the country. The emotions quite rightly attached to this topic mean it is prominent in any conversation about health disparities. It was brought up as a key example of health disparities by a number of respondents in the Commission's call for evidence. It is important that all involved in these conversations understand that highlighting this disparity without emphasising the low numbers overall is unfair to expectant mothers everywhere. As the MBRR ACE-UK states, quote, Many women have found these figures very worrying, and it is important always to qualify such stark statistics with absolute numbers. In 2016 to 2018 in the UK, 34 black women died amongst every 100,000 giving birth. 
15 Asian women died amongst every 100,000 giving birth, and 8 white women died amongst every 100,000 giving birth. End quote. Although incidence of maternal mortality is rare, the increased rates seen in ethnic minority groups need to be better understood and explained. The Commission is aware that work is being done in this area both in government and as part of the NHS long-term plan. The Commissioners believe that more research into the causes in the disparities of maternal mortality should be one of the highest priorities for the new Office of Health Disparities outlined in the recommendation below. Access to healthcare and attitudes towards the NHS. The key health outcome inequalities addressed above, such as life expectancy differences, have arisen over decades and even centuries and are driven by an unequal distribution of the wider determinants of health, such as employment, income, housing, social networks, education, and access to green space. However, healthcare inequalities for example, different groups receiving differential access to services, diagnosis and treatment, are also important and can contribute to differences in health outcomes, although they may have a minor role. There are differences in attitudes to different forms of health care across the ethnic groups. South Asian groups in Scotland had higher avoidable hospital admissions than the white Scottish group, with the highest rate in Pakistani men and women. There may be issues to access and quality of primary care to prevent avoidable hospital admissions, especially for South Asian people. There was little variation between ethnic groups in hospital length of stay or unplanned readmissions. There is little difference in measures of patient satisfaction with received hospital care amongst the ethnic groups. For example, in 2018 to 2019, the average satisfaction score out of 100 for black African people is 76.9, compared to patients from Bangladeshi, 69.2, Pakistani, 72.6, and white British, 76.1, ethnic groups. Satisfaction with GP services presents a more nuanced picture. While there are few differences between white British, black African and black Caribbean patients, the percentage of Asian patients reporting positive experiences tends to be lower for example, 85.5% of white British patients, compared with 86.3% of black African patients, and 726 of those from the Bangladeshi ethnic group. Such a pattern is repeated with satisfaction with access to out-of-hours GP services. For example, 69.7% of white British patients report positive experiences, compared with 70.1% of black Caribbean patients, and 59.1% of those from the Bangladeshi ethnic group. It is important to note that majorities of all groups report positive experiences, and that while the relative lack of satisfaction with GP services among some British Asian people is of concern, the overall picture suggests that racism and discrimination are not widespread in the health system, as is sometimes claimed, as black groups are more or less equal in their satisfaction to white groups. COVID-19 In light of the events of 2020, the Commission also analysed the emerging data relating to COVID-19 and has met with experts and frontline staff to discuss the pandemic. Due to the extensive work being carried out elsewhere, including the quarterly reports published by the Minister for Equalities, the Commission has not focused in detail on COVID-19 in this report but we have examined evidence on the rates and causes of the disparities in infection and deaths amongst ethnic minorities. The evidence shows that the raw data on deaths reflects the ethnic balance of the country, with the white British group accounting for 82% of the deaths in hospitals in England up to the 24th of March 2021. The white British population share was 80.5% of the population in 2011. But once adjustment for the age profile of a group is made, the numbers look very different, and in the first wave, black African men were almost 3.4 times more likely to die than white British men, with black Caribbean and South Asian people also being at higher risk of death. This is mainly due to increased risk of infection. For example, geographical factors such as living in a densely populated inner city area, socio-economic demographics, Characteristics, deprivation and occupation, 
living in larger and multi-generational households. It is also partly due to poorer outcomes once infected, due to comorbidities such as obesity, diabetes and chronic kidney disease. After adjustment for these risk factors, the difference with the white British death rate reduces significantly for all ethnic groups. Figure 22. COVID-19 age standardised mortality rates in the first and second waves of the pandemic by ethnicity and gender. Audio description of chart. This bar chart shows two figures, one for wave one and one for wave two, which shows the number of deaths per 100,000 of the population. These figures are broken down by ethnic group and figures are provided for both men and women. Salient facts shown by the chart. In both wave one and wave two, the mortality rate for men is always higher than for women. With the exception of the Pakistani ethnic group, the deaths in wave one were always higher than wave two. The ethnic groups on the chart are generally listed from the lowest number of deaths per 100,000 to the highest. They are in the following order. White British, white other, Chinese, mixed, Indian, other, black Caribbean, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, black African. End of audio description. The second report of the COVID-19 review of disparities looking at the disproportionate impact the pandemic has had on ethnic minorities, also describes how the impact on certain ethnic minority groups has changed between the first and second waves. It asserts that changes within this period suggest inequalities in outcomes for different ethnic groups are driven by a risk of infection, as opposed to ethnicity alone being a risk factor. The report also highlights insights into some ethnic minority people's experiences of COVID-19. Particularly that messaging was felt to be aimed at a single homogeneous ethnic minority group who were vulnerable to COVID-19. Participants reported that they felt this was stigmatising. Participants also reported that they felt public health messages were sometimes difficult to apply to their everyday lives. COVID-19 as an infectious disease is a specific case with risk factors operating differently to other common causes of death. Indeed, some of the risk factors that would protect against other diseases, for example living in a multi-generational household, have increased the risk of infection and death from COVID-19. Continued data and evidence is needed in order to understand further the causes of the COVID-19 risk factors disparities, the relative importance of different factors to each other and their interactions, and the reasons why different people who are infected experience different outcomes. The government has given Professor Thomas Yates, University of Leicester, funding to examine whether the increased risk of developing severe COVID-19 in ethnic minority groups is explained by differences in underlying health status, lifestyle behaviours, such as physical activity and environmental factors, including measures of social inequality. The study will help to build a picture of how the increased risk in ethnic minority communities may be prevented or managed to help tailor public health policy in the future. During its engagements with stakeholders, the Commission heard a sense of frustration about the amount of time taken for these differing factors to be understood. The Commission welcomes the recommendations made in the Government's first quarterly report on the progress to address COVID-19 health inequalities, particularly, quote, continuing to improve our understanding of ethnic minority audiences and interests of each ethnic minority outlet to ensure messaging is targeted and nuanced and build on the existing communications program with respected third-party voices to improve reach, understanding and positive health behaviours. End quote. The key to reducing these disparities is reducing risk of infection and vaccination enables that. It is therefore essential to continue making every effort to increase vaccine confidence and the uptake in ethnic minorities, particularly amongst the younger cohorts, to protect themselves, their elderly relatives and the wider community. Mental health One area of particular interest for the Commission was mental health. There has been some significant work in this area recently, specifically the Wesley Review and the 2020 government response to that review. 
The Wesley Review found that black people were eight times more likely to be subjected to community treatment orders than white people, and four times more likely to be detained. Figures from the Race Disparity Unit showed that there were 306.8 detentions per 100,000 for black people, compared with 72.9 per 100,000 white people, not adjusted for age and deprivation. The disparity is most pronounced for black other groups. However, it should be noted that these rates are potentially overestimate, as the other category may be used for people whose specific ethnicity isn't known, as also seen with the any other group. Rates are much lower for the black African and black Caribbean groups. Rates for Asians tend to be lower than for black but higher than white groups, with the exception of the Indian and Chinese ethnic groups for whom there is a near parity. Such disparity is often taken as evidence of racism. However, it must be benchmarked against disparity in the prevalence of mental illness. A meta-analysis conducted by Hal Vasrad et al. 2019 of 28 studies concluded there were significantly higher risks of diagnosed schizophrenia amongst ethnic minority groups and that they were most pronounced amongst black groups. For instance, the relative risk for the black African group was 572 compared with the white British, for black Caribbean 5.2. Elevated risks were also found for South Asians, 2.27, white other, 2.24, and mixed, 2.24 ethnic groups. Experts advise that mental ill health has little to do with genetic predisposition, but rather is to do with adverse social circumstances, including racism and hardship. In 2018, the Synergy Collaborative Centre, a national initiative to consider ethnic inequality in mental health and deprivation, led by Professor Kamal Deep Bui from Queen Mary University of London, published a briefing on the relationship between racism and mental health, suggesting that the fear of racism and racist attacks amongst people from ethnic minority groups can lead to chronic stress. As well as being harmful in itself, it can also weaken resilience and, in parents, can affect the mental health of their children. The authors conclude that, quote, There is a growing and convincing body of evidence that psychosis and depression, substance misuse and anger are more likely in those exposed to racism. End quote. Minority and immigrant groups are more likely to experience mental health difficulties in many countries all over the world including white minorities in majority white countries. For example, in Northern Ireland, the suicide rate amongst male Irish travellers in 2010 was over 6.5 times greater than that for men in the general population. Other studies have shown similar disparities for migrants to Denmark from Greenland, as well as white men from non-English-speaking backgrounds emigrating to Australia. A number of interconnected factors are associated with the onset, progression, and relapse of mental health problems. These are genetic and epigenetic. Childhood environments such as an early family relationship, social learning and childhood experiences, and adolescent and adult environment, such as stressful life events including divorce, unemployment and poor living conditions. The Commission notes that many ethnic minority individuals will be more exposed to these factors, contributing to their elevated risk. There is also evidence that black and Asian people with mental health needs are less likely to be receiving treatment. A study by Cooper et al. 2012 concluded black people were less likely to be taking antidepressants, odds ratio 0.4, after controlling for symptom severity. The same paper found black groups, odds ratio 0.7, and South Asian, 0.5 groups, were less likely to have contacted a GP about their mental health within the last year, after controlling for socioeconomic status and symptom severity. Ethnicity facts and figures show that black people were just 1.3 times more likely than white people to be receiving mental health care, with the black African group actually less likely, 0.9 times. The Commission is convinced that a lack of uptake of treatment may stem from fears that mental health provision is discriminatory, manifesting itself in people of an ethnic minority seeking help elsewhere, or putting off getting help so that the problem manifests itself later, in some cases in the criminal justice system. 
there is evidence to suggest that black Caribbean and black African patients have been found to be more likely to come into contact with mental health services through more negative routes, such as referral by a criminal justice agency, than white British patients. In the Commission's call for evidence, this view was apparent with individuals and organisations referencing mistrust within the mental health system as a barrier and cause of disparity amongst ethnic minority groups. Quote, We're also reluctant to admit mental health issues because we lack confidence in the system, which can lead to incarceration instead of mental health care, or being classed and treated on the basis of a stereotype. End quote. The Commission does not believe that the evidence it reviewed offers support of claims of discrimination within psychiatry. The Commission views the challenge, therefore, as being partly one of convincing vulnerable people in ethnic minorities that mental health care provision is neither a threat nor a punishment, but something genuinely helpful to people in real need. Targeted public awareness programmes aimed at ethnic minority communities with models of collaboration between NHS voluntary sector and faith organisations can reduce stigma, facilitate early and appropriate access to care, and reduce the risk of coercive entry into services, for example, detention under a Mental Health Act. Evidence from Norway shows that an early detection programme with targeted educational packages reduces treatment delays both in the short and the long term. The Joint Commissioning Panel for Mental Health is a collaboration co-chaired by the Royal College of General Practitioners and the Royal College of Psychiatrists, which brings together organisations with an interest in commissioning mental health services. They have produced a guide which describes what good mental health services for people from ethnic minority groups looks like. Among its ten key messages for commissioners are Commissioners should identify and address any ethnic inequalities and services should be culturally capable and meet the needs of a multicultural population through effective interventions. The government has published its Mental Health White Paper, which takes forward recommendations from the Wesley Review, including reform of the Mental Health Act, to enable greater patient choice and support in the care system, and supporting community-based mental health support that can prevent avoidable detentions. This should help towards reducing high detention rates, and to build trust amongst all patients, and particularly those from black ethnic minority groups. Improving the data There are numerous places where limitations in the available data need to be addressed. Future research needs to see the investigation of differences between risk in ethnic groups as central to the research and not a spin-off. The UK is very well placed for this type of research, given the strength of its health data and cohort studies, such as the UK Biobank which contains in-depth genetic and health information from half a million UK participants. However, the low representation of ethnic groups in these studies means it is challenging to run analysis into subgroup differences, and particularly the interaction between genetics and environment in causation of disease. The Commission has had conversations with the leaders of two very large-scale research programmes due to start in the coming years. The Adolescent Cohort Study, which plans to recruit 100,000 adolescents, and Our Future Health Study of 5 million adults. There was agreement with both about the need to ensure that ethnic minorities are recruited in proportion to their future share of the population, reflecting demographic changes, and so allow for more in depth studies in these areas. Other generally underrepresented groups, based on geography and deprivation, will also be oversampled so as to better understand the underlying drivers of poorer health in these groups. One of the challenges raised in these conversations was that of recruiting people from ethnic minorities for genetic studies and clinical research in general. There was a question of whether this was due to mistrust of biomedical research in minority communities due to historical abuses in other countries, logistical barriers to recruitment, and a lack of diversity in researchers designing and leading these studies. Case Study – Our Future Health Our Future Health will be the UK's largest ever health research programme, designed to help people live healthier lives for longer through the discovery and testing of more effective approaches to prevention, early detection, and improved treatment of diseases such as dementia, cancer, diabetes, 
heart disease and stroke. It will collect and link multiple sources of health and health-relevant information, including genetic data, across a diverse and inclusive cohort of 5 million people that reflects the UK population. Our Future Health is committed to building a resource that truly reflects the UK population, so it can identify differences in how diseases begin and progress in men and women from different backgrounds. It is vital that a diverse range of people join the study, so discoveries that are made benefit everyone. In the past, some groups have not had enough representation in health research. This includes people from black communities, Asian communities, and people from other minority ethnic groups. It also includes people living in less wealthy parts of the country. This means that the medical advances made from past research may not benefit everyone equally. This would be the most diverse cohort ever recruited in the UK, with up to one million participants from ethnic minorities and the largest such multi-ethnic cohort in the world. Our Future Health plans to focus particular effort on recruiting and retaining three key groups, South Asian people, black people, and people of low socio-economic status and high deprivation. Recognising the challenges faced by research studies in recruiting participants from these groups, additional efforts are being made to ensure good representations of these groups that have previously been underserved or underrepresented in health research. To that end, there is a comprehensive and lasting programme of public engagement and involvement with numerous focus groups, meetings and interviews already having been held with the public and relevant stakeholders, to inform the development of the protocol and the participant materials. The UK is uniquely well-placed to deliver this project, with an exceptional track record in population research. A diverse, ethnically and socio-economically, population willing to take part in research and a government that is committed to levelling up the major inequalities in health outcomes seen across this population. Targeting campaigns The Commission heard from representatives from frontline services, health sector charities, local authority health departments and regional representatives of Public Health England on the topic of best practice providing healthcare support and messages to different groups. Some of these organisations provided examples of health campaigns and programmes they run which target specific ethnicities or specific postcodes or socially deprived areas. Representatives also expressed frustration that lessons learned from such campaigns weren't being effectively shared across different locations or organisations and more coordination was required. One contributor articulated the Quote, need for one place to go and find out how other organisations or initiatives had successfully landed health messages to enable scaling up and spending funding properly. End quote. Case study. Sussex Health and Care Partnership. The project took the form of a locally commissioned service to primary care, whereby GPs were empowered to support patients in at-risk groups for COVID-19. All practices in Sussex were offered access to the locally commissioned service. 95 to 98% of GP practices took up the service. The local authority public health team complemented this work by producing benchmark for practices to highlight their population demographics. GPs identified the patients they needed to target, those from areas of high deprivation and people from high-risk ethnicities. They were also asked to focus on equity of access. There were two components to the locally commissioned service, Parts A and B. Part A had three proactive elements. 1. Messaging around risk to ethnic minority groups. 37 languages translated available to GPs for their use, centrally designed and then GPs could add nuances. Also highlighted proactive measures such as usefulness of vitamin D, shielding advice and hand, face and space, reinforcing public health messaging on how to stay safe. 2. Holistic reviews for ethnic minority patients who have additional modifiable risk factors, one-to-one -one telephone appointments, to offer support in tackling smoking, obesity, CVD, diabetes, respiratory illness, mental health and social needs. 3. 
encourage practices to reflect on equality of access, including ethnicity recording and representation of ethnic minority patients on patient participation groups. Part B focused on acute and reactive care in at-risk patients diagnosed with COVID-19. 1. Once patients have a positive COVID-19 diagnosis, additional remote monitoring of their condition was offered based on their clinical risk profile. For example, patients living in areas of highest deprivation, patients from ethnic minority, not including white minority, backgrounds and patients with comorbidities, irrespective of ethnicity or deprivation. 2. Pulse oximetry and regular welfare calls were offered at home to such patients. If suitable for home monitoring, patients are offered a pulse oximeter with instructions, a remote COVID-19 monitoring diary and regular welfare checks. In addition to the above, Community champions were deployed to talk to GPs about what they could offer to support local communities, including forums and training sessions with GPs. The Clinical Commissioning Group developed a detailed locally commissioned service specification, protocols for managing patients based on NHSE guidance and online resources to support practices in this work. The main intended benefits include Enhancing relations between practices and communities by creating a lasting legacy of improved engagement. Populations having access to the information they need in languages of their choice, over 27,679 letters in 36 languages were sent out. Culturally appropriate monitoring of patients, over 1,750 holistic reviews and over 170 saturation probes have been provided by pulse oximetry at home and expected outcomes will include whether this approach reduced hospital admissions and whether there was a reduction in severe illness and deaths. Positive, qualitative feedback was received from both practitioners and the community. Creating agency Although previous research has shown that policies or interventions in the UK to reduce obesity by focusing on changing individuals' behaviour, for example, diet and physical activity, have not always been successful, it is also true that interventions to reduce diabetes and cardiovascular diseases have been shown to be effective internationally. Limited research has been conducted in ethnic minorities in the UK to assess the effectiveness of such interventions to date, partly due to the low numbers of ethnic minority participants in trials. Novel interventions using smartphones and AI could be developed as well as culturally tailored interventions, for example extended family-based interventions. The Commission's view is that individuals and communities of all ethnicities should be encouraged to take control of their own health, this would be both in relation to changing their own behaviours and in taking part in research studies to see what is effective. Communities can take steps to improve their own health outcomes and be helped to do so, particularly where they are more susceptible to certain health conditions, for example diabetes in South Asian groups, high blood pressure in black groups and many cancers in white groups, all of which have modifiable risk factors for example diet, physical inactivity, tobacco and alcohol. The COVID-19 pandemic has also provided a stark reminder that many of these risk factors, for example diabetes and obesity, also increased the risk of death from COVID-19 and showed the critical role that clinical research plays in providing treatments and vaccines. It is hoped that this will encourage people to change their behaviour and to participate in research studies. Case Study Office for Minority Health, US The Office of Minority Health is a federal agency set up in 1986 at the Department of Health and Human Services. Their mission is to improve the health of racial and ethnic minority populations through development of health policies and programs that will help eliminate health disparities. The Institute has a $281 million budget to conduct and support research, training, research capacity and infrastructure development, public education and information dissemination programs to improve minority health and to reduce health disparities. 
Focus areas. 1. Prevention, physical activity and nutrition. 2. Clinical conditions, such as substance use, disorders, hypertension, HIV, maternal health, sickle cell disease and trait, diabetes, including prevention of peripheral artery and kidney diseases, lupus, Alzheimer's and cancer prevention. For example, stomach, liver and cervical cancer. 3. Individual social needs and social determinants of health. Program priorities for 2020 to 2021. 1. Supporting states, territories and tribes in identifying and sustaining health equity promoting policies, programs and practices. 2. Expanding the use of community health workers to address health and social service needs within ethnic minority communities. 3. Strengthening cultural competence among healthcare providers throughout the country. Recommendation 11. Promote fairness. Establish the Office for Health Disparities. This commission recommends that the government establish a new office to properly target health disparities in the UK, the Office for Health Disparities. This office would be an independent body, which would work alongside the NHS as part of, or in place of, a redesigned Public Health England to improve healthy life expectancy across the UK and in all groups and reduce inequalities. As most of the causes of health inequalities, deprivation, tobacco, alcohol, unhealthy diet and physical inactivity, are not due to differences in health care, addressing them will involve multiple government departments, and so the office would need to be cross-cutting across a government. A. Increasing programmes aimed at levelling up health care and health outcomes. Use existing data and evidence to target those communities with the worst health outcomes due to deprivation or ethnicity for tailored health interventions, health education and communications. This function would work alongside existing local health workers and would utilise best practice examples from local authorities and public health regional offices and charities. B. Improving the data, guidance and expertise in the causes and solutions for health disparities for specific groups. This would include Funding further research into health conditions which adversely impact specific groups. This would include a large focus on research into health disparities affecting the more deprived communities and different ethnic groups, including white people, where they have worse outcomes, considering genetic and biological differences cultural practices and socio-economic drivers. Providing best practice for the inclusion of known health disparities, including those experienced by more deprived communities and different ethnic groups, including white, in clinical care guidelines. Work closely with the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence and other bodies to ensure all guidance includes information on disparities as standard. Providing expertise in how the health of different ethnic groups, including white and affected by underlying conditions, cultural and linguistic practices, geography and occupation. This experience would be disaggregated to avoid unhelpful grouping of different ethnicities and to ensure proper tailoring of health services. The first priorities for the new OHD should include Research 1. Mental health commissioning new research into the causes and mental health conditions and the reasons for disparities in levels and outcomes, focus research into the most effective upstream interventions and best ways to improve access to these services. 2. Clinical conditions, commissioning further research into the causes of the disparities in life-limiting health conditions identified above, including those conditions where white ethnic groups perform badly in comparison to ethnic minorities. 3. Prevention. Commissioning further research into the most effective preventative approaches that can be fully tailored to different groups. 4. Investigating barriers to increasing diversity of participants into clinical research studies, including clinical trials and genetic studies and identifying solutions. Health education and communications. 1. Improving health literacy in those with poorer health outcomes, 
including those from more deprived backgrounds and some ethnic groups. 2. Targeted campaigns to tackle the stigma associated with the mental care system in different groups. 3. Campaigns to improve participation in clinical trials, cohort studies, underrepresented groups including ethnic minority groups and more deprived populations. 4. Campaigns to improve uptake of interventions to prevent diseases, including screening and vaccination. Expertise 1. Establish a team of experts with cultural understanding of different communities, including white groups, to provide nationwide advice to healthcare providers. These should include community liaison contacts who have an in-depth knowledge of the communities that they work with as well as an in-depth knowledge of services available. These contacts aim to act as the conduit directing community members to the services that are most culturally appropriate to their needs, to work closely with existing third and public sector groups in this space. Professor Sir John Bell, FRS, Regius Professor of Medicine at Oxford University, has given his support for this recommendation, saying, quote, I fully endorse the Commission's recommendation that the Government launch a new Office for Health Disparities. This will help us to understand the key drivers of health disparities in the UK, particularly in relation to supporting research investigating the relative importance of genes, lifestyle and environment in different groups' health outcomes. The soon-to-be-launched Our Future Health study of 5 million UK adults will be the largest such research study in the world and has been designed to ensure that it fully represents both ethnic minorities and deprived communities who have been underrepresented in the past, and we would welcome a strong focus from the government in this area to help achieve that objective. End quote. Professor Nick Wareham, FMed Sci, Director at Medical Research Council Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge and of the Centre for Diet and Activity Research, also supports the creation of the OHD, stating, quote, There is a need for a greater research focus on the causes for health disparities in this country, and, most importantly, on the development and evaluation of possible solutions. By establishing a home for the evidence, communications and expertise into one space, the Office for Health Disparities will ensure we can move forward in tackling these disparities. The recommendation to coordinate and enhance efforts to increase participation by people from ethnic minorities in observational and interventional studies would be of vital help to researchers, and we look forward to working alongside the office. End quote. 